Greetings, legendary listeners. Welcome to the Marvelous TV Club, a podcast tackling our collective obsession with the latest releases from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And today we are all about the third episode of Falcon and the Winter Soldier titled Power Broker. Every week we analyze the latest chapter of the MCU from all sorts of unique angles. On Monday, Christine Kippens and I will bring you our character cast where we will take stock of the continuing development of Sam and Bucky and get inside the minds of Sharon and Zemo. On Wednesday, Jesse Taylor and our show PonderVision will zoom out to ask the strangest and most intriguing questions that linger as we look to episode four. But as always, we begin our weekly analysis with this show, StoryCast. This is where we break down TV episodes, not by plot, but by themes, symbols, illusions, and archetypes. You won't get this kind of analysis on any other Marvel pod. I am your host, Mark Folletti, and today I am joined by our two story experts from Salon.com, writer Amanda Marcotte. How are you doing, Amanda? Good, good. How are you? Doing all right. Uh, And uh, from Manhattan College, professor of English, Dr. Maeve Adams. Hey, Dr. A. Good evening. So would you guys visit Madripoor? Yeah. (laughs) For sure. I mean, first of all, um, it's been a terrible, terrible time of not being able to go anywhere. So I'd frankly literally go anywhere that's not my apartment. Yeah. Um, you know, and the local environments of my neighborhood in Bushwick. But it also looks pretty badass. I mean, I'd like to go to one of those parties. If I had a chance to literally party, just like, I know it was <laughs> wrong. I know it's wrong to just like slosh a cocktail around like some asshole right in front of a Monet. <laughs> But, you know, 100% um, got to live your life. You got to get out there and do it, you know, when the opportunity comes. And what about snake testicle cocktails? Where do we stand on those? I, I feel no need to engage in the superstitious beliefs that eating the testicles of endangered animals will make you more manly for many, many reasons. <laughs> I mean, if it's not endangered, then I mean, I kind of have a policy that I'll try anything that's edible. So when I watched him drinking it, I was seriously asking myself, Maeve or Dr. A, (laughs) would you consume that? And I said to myself, of course I would, because that's who you are. Yeah, that's some that's some lo- uh, some supervillain shit. I'm into it. <laughs> well, and already like it's it's a pretty funny joke, like right on the super serum concept, right? The whole point of <laughs> yeah, it's of good. Eating testicles is the superstitious belief it makes you more manly, and that's literally mm. what the super serum does. Holy yeah. shit! I can't believe that the snake testicles fit the theme of the show. That's. You guys already blow my mind. This is why I love StoryCast so much. So look, we're going to get into a couple different themes tonight. A lot happened in this episode. We open with a jailbreak that happens mostly off screen. And I have some questions about how that card got in that book and whatnot. But uh, Mm. we obviously got Sharon Carter back in our lives when we visit Madripoor. And uh, we learned a little more about Carly and her backstory and what's going on with the Flag Smashers, which admittedly is a little different than we thought last week. So I'm excited to get into that some more. But we should talk about this show, not by its plot, like I said, but by its themes. So Maeve, talk to me. What's a theme that jumped out at you from this episode of Falcon and the Winter Soldier? Well, one theme that kind of runs all the way through this episode, and I think is also core to the show show more broadly, or, or hopefully will be, is a meditation on the problems that come from the idea or ideology that might makes right. Mm. So, right, we've got early in the episode, um, you know, our Captain America um, and his buddy Lamar are uh, off trying to figure out where the Flag Smashers are and are sort of shaking down the guy who has the safe house. You know, remember the chicken liver dinner guy? Oh, okay. yeah. Um, <laughs> so, you know, and of course, you know, he's the guy is not forthcoming and uh, pretends he doesn't speak English. And, you know, he says, do you know who I am? You know, in this kind of like, you know, uh, uber aggressive um, insistence that, you know, violence here is acceptable because he's trying to figure out what's, you know, he's trying to figure out the problem of the Flag Smashers. So I have to ask you a question because offline, Christine Kippens from CharacterCast was like, does Maeve really believe and accept John Walker as Captain America? Because she kept calling him Cap. And you just did it again. So I want to give you a chance to go on record because I want to ask the hard questions here on StoryCast. Yeah. 
Maeve Adams, do you accept John Walker as your Captain America? As my Captain America? It's like, you know, did I accept Donald Trump as my president? Uh, that's a hard no on okay. both. Okay. Um, you know, I, I, I only call him that because it's the character that he's embodying, right? He believes that he's Captain America. And I, th I think that matters. Not that I think that we necessarily, you know, have to... Uh, go so far as to always refer to him as Cap. And I, uh, Kristen, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that note. Uh, I'm going to take it. But I do, you know, I think it's important that, especially, you know, in an episode that's also interested in the problems of symbolism, right? The way that, um, you know, you know, as, as Zemo himself says, symbols are dangerous things, mm -hmm. um, or he describes them that way. So, I, you know, I think it matters that, that, that John sort of takes, a, you know, really embodies in his own mind the symbol of Captain America. And it's related to what else is happening in that scene where, you know, Lamar is translating for, for John. Uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and what he doesn't translate for John, which I think is really interesting, is when, when you know, the safe house guy who probably has a name and I don't know what it is. I don't think we know it. Bruno. Bruno. Oh. No, no, I just okay. made that up. He's a oh. generic German guy, Bruno. <laughs> generic guy. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, he says, you Americans have become brutes. And I think it's really interesting that Lamar doesn't translate that mm -hmm. to John. Great point. Um, who clearly believes in this idea that his, his, you know, sort of super heroic violence is acceptable because, as he says later in the episode, if we get the job done, are they going to sweat us on how? Right. Because for, for, for John and, you know, arguably also for the American government in this show and, and, and arguably in the Avengers universe, might does make right, and that's acceptable. Um, and there are lots of other sort of moments in this episode that suggest that to us, right? Zemo very explicitly talks about ends and means when he's talking to Bucky. He says, you know, he's, you know, they, they've made him, they've made him Winter Soldier and stripped him of his humanity and forced him to do horribly violent things. He says to him, it wasn't personal, you were simply a means to a necessary end, right? So again, this kind of means ends logic might makes right, violence is okay as long as the objective is one that we can think of as, mm, if not virtuous, good in some, in some Desirable. way. Desirable. Yeah. In the first Avenger, and kind of just central to Captain America's entire, like the, the real Captain America, <laughs> my <laughs> Captain America. <laughs> um, like central to Steve Rogers story is the idea of very much that might does not make right. Right. Mm -hmm. Like the irony of the character from the very first movie is that he was picked because he's weak, but courageous that he is, that his strength is, is spiritual. It's moral. Dr. Erskine says very specifically that the serum really only kind of manifests what's on the inside and, and, and Steve only becomes this like super strong and, and amazing superhero because deep down inside that's who he was. And the reason that he was is that he does not, he just eschews that philosophy altogether and does not believe it at all. Yeah. One of his most important lines in Avengers Infinity War is when he tells Vision, we don't trade lives. And that is very explicitly the opposite argument of the ends justify the means. It is yeah. the means must always be right and true. But I would point out that Steve, um, as the movies kind of go on, becomes less and less the emblem of his own philosophy that mm. the ends do not justify the means, the means have to be good, right? Which is to say he often decides that the rules are bad or to cut corners or whatever, because he thinks that he knows better and he knows what the actual outcome is. And we, yeah. the audience don't question that very much because he always ends up being right. I mean, I think towards the end, we start to see the sort of limits of his philosophy. He tells vision, we don't trade lives, but then they do for vision's life. They trade how many Wakandan lives? Right. And yeah. that big yeah. battle. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, they trade lives and, and the movies really start to grapple with the fact that like, sometimes it's not as simple as, as these kind of black and white, um, moral stories that Steve kind of would like to believe in. Um, and, you know, I'll end this by saying that 
a lot of the ways that Steve is the person who decides what is right and wrong ends up being the fact that he can because he's the most powerful, which is something right. Zemo latches on to. Zemo is worth thinking about here because he, in this episode, is the ultimate Machiavellian, right? He's comfortable with and, and insistent about the various kinds of violence and the various kind of betrayals of self, right? Including Bucky, Bucky's own betrayal. He, he has to go back to be the one that, that he n- believes he no longer is, that, that he was made, you know, made to be, uh, that these kind of betrayals of self are acceptable and the violence is acceptable because it, this needs to get done. And, you know, and, you know, I think theories of violence, philosophies of violence talk about things like the state of exception, we would not only be wrong historically, but we would all be also be a little misguided to assume that there's some kind of utopian universe in which violence is never necessary, particularly when we're talking about state power, right? And how states ensure the security of their citizens' lives. I think one of the things that is fascinating about this episode, to speak to what you're you're talking about in terms of like the collateral damage, is that the episode spends a lot of time in almost kind of like postmodern detail, like really over the top detail, reflecting on the collateral damage that this approach requires and generates. So like, for example, when they finally find out where Dr. Nagel is and they go see him and Sharon has to stay outside, the fact that there is literally you know, a bazillion uh, (laughs) bounty hunters. Yeah. It's got to kind of like, there's, I mean, I say it's kind of postmodern because it's kind of over the top. The collateral, all these people dying, like kind of bad bounty, there's some of them are like kind of shitty, obviously. They kind of know what they're doing. And she's obviously getting kind of bad bashed up in the process. But that collateral damage is crucial to, to, I think, what, 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 what you're talking about, Amanda, and also the way that this episode is kind of meditating on this problem. Yeah, the collateral damage point jumps out at me, too, because Sharon makes the argument for why everything that happened in Civil War cost her so much. She was the walking symbol of collateral damage. Yeah. And I do think it gets to some of what you're talking about with Steve, Amanda. I'm wondering if you would endorse this statement. Steve Rogers (laughs) is a hypocrite. Yes. (laughs) I mean, I, 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 he's a hypocrite, and but he's a hypocrite in the way that everybody is because everyone sees things from their own point of view, right? Mm. So Steve yeah. always imagines himself as being a, a righteously good person who eschews might makes right and mm-hmm. ignores, I think, the way that he set he decides he does he often just ignores debate, like with Tony Stark, like. Tony makes really good points and Steve, instead of engaging as the good Democrat that he thinks that he is, who should engage (laughs) in discourse and debate and and try to like resolve things through compromise, just decides that he's going to do what he's going to do because he can. And I think what's interesting is on the flip side of that, we have Zemo, right? Who, Mm. like you said, Maeve, is presented as the ultimate Machiavellian, but for his ultimate goal is an anti-Machiavellian goal. He yeah. wants to hmm. eradicate superheroes. He wants to eradicate super yeah. people because he believes, he believes might doesn't make right. He thinks that their presence and their very existence creates a world where might makes right. And he doesn't want that world. He, yeah. and he's willing to become the thing he hates in order to eradicate the thing he hates. That's a really excellent way of thinking about it. In you know, in part because the other feature of Zemo that is complicating for us as uh, viewers trying to understand, you know, what his Machiavellianism means is that he, the other feature is that he is the kind of philosopher of the episode, right? So he explains to Sam and to Bucky the, the, the sort of principles that they are both, they need to both operate by and also the ones that they are violating. There's a really fascinating moment that I had to watch several times over because I, I, I couldn't quite figure out what it meant, but I think it relates to this, to this point that you're making, Amanda. So they're they're walking in Riga, and and Zemo says, I, "I don't suppose any of you bothered visiting the memorial in Sokovia." I think he's sort of taking them to task over the fact that the ends justify the means argument has at, at its core not just a, an effort to justify bad behavior in the service of good results, 
but that it means also that you ignore the ethical dimensions of what you've done. Like there's no reflective capacity. Like you don't look back and say, you know what, maybe I actually need to do a little bit of reparative work to address the fact that I did some, th that horrible things happened. So that reparation is necessary in the, of some kind, some kind of reflection and reparation is necessary in the wake of violence, even if the ends were good. Even if we can all agree that they were good. And in that case, of course, we can't necessarily all agree that they were good. And this is something that Endgame and Infinity War really mm. dig into deeply because Steve repeatedly says to Tony Stark, Tony gets caught up on the collateral damage question, right? And yeah. all the people that died in Sokovia while we were kicking ass. <laughs> and, um, and Steve basically makes that the soldier argument, the, that people die in war, you try to minimize it, but unfortunately yeah. there's just no way to get around it. So it's really pretty smart what Marvel's doing. It holds Steve mm -hmm. out as this kind of icon of pure goodness and then shows the limits of that mentality, even with the person who has that ideology. Because at the end of yeah. the day, as much as Steve is like the karate kid, like only punch in defense kind of mentality, the lines between whether or not what you're doing is self-defense or defense of others and aggressive action fall down, fall apart pretty quickly, especially when you're talking collateral damage. Yeah. So if we're talking about collateral damage, if we're talking about ends justifying the means and the limitations of that, I feel like we do have to talk about the prison break itself, right? Mm. Because while we can be shocked at how John Walker treats that German guy in the cafe, Think about what Bucky's plan caused in terms of damage, right? All these prisoners get into a riot that he created. There's a guard who gets beaten up and I assume knocked out in a bathroom so that Zemo can take his outfit. And that's just the shit we know about. Yeah. So how do we, how do we wrestle with what Sam and Bucky chose to do? Well, not Sam. Huh. And very pointedly, not Sam. How do we wrestle with what Bucky did here uh, to get Zemo out? Because the show doesn't spend a lot of time haggling with that question, I guess. Or does it? I don't know. It's a it's a tricky scene because it, it shares features with the scene that we see while they're meeting with Dr. Nagel. So it's a lot of close-up camera work, a lot of like fast, fast cut, you know, sharp cuts, fast paced, some some, you know, handheld camera work also. So we're kind of put in the middle of this scene and forced to reckon with the physicality of it, which I think is important if we, if the show is asking us to reckon with the problem of collateral damage. We, we're put in the position of that prisoner when he receives the, the note that says, he's going to kill you tonight, so kill him first. If the show is doing something subtle with the superhero story, it may be this that it is forcing us to experience the collateral damage in a way that's almost like something like Pulp Fiction, right? Like, huh. so, you know, a, 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 or, or any of those kind of, um, those really kind of garishly violent films. So, you know, Pulp Fiction is one of them. Kill Bill is another one, right? These shows that force us to experience the viscerality of the collateral damage that comes from these choices, and so, yes, it may, in fact, be necessary. But when do, where do we draw a border around the state of exception? And to that, I would add that what I thought the prison break scene did really cleverly was it felt you, that visceral violence humanized the prisoners. It's very normal in a lot of TV yeah. shows and movies to treat people in prisons as a uh, class deserving of violence and pain. And this episode very much rejected that. We were reminded at multiple times that all the characters, all of them yeah. um, that we engage with have been labeled criminals and have been imprisoned or some other somehow been treated like criminals. And so we can't otherwise, we don't know anything about the people that got into that prison riot, but we are not allowed. It's the way it was filmed. We just weren't allowed to otherize them. We, yeah. we felt terrible about the fact that this guy was tricked into starting a fight that may have gotten people killed. Yeah. Wow. There's a similar experience we have with Carly. It's not in the filming techniques there so much, 
as in the way the narrative develops our emp empathy for her, that she wanted to be a teacher of history or art. And the way that the, I mean, again, we, we get some, some interesting camera work there where the, the shots are really close up. She is acting that character, the one who is mourning the loss of a, of a life that she will never have, right? She is collateral damage too. And, you know, she's, she's misguided, but everybody in this episode is misguided. <laughs> right. And, you know, I mean, Carly is misguided. Sam is misguided. Zemo is misguided. Sharon is misguided. She knows it better than anybody else. Right. She talks about that stars and stripes bullshit. Right. Like she's the cynic of this episode. And it's great. Zemo is kind of our philosopher. Sharon is our cynic. Um, until Sam it, later in the episode says, says to Bucky, how many people have to get steamrolled to make way for this hunk of metal? Yeah. Right. And he's obviously talking about not Captain America. I don't know. <laughs> Isaiah. Yeah. Isaiah Bradley, who is like the ultimate symbol of collateral damage. Right. Yeah. And of course, that's in our last, you know, last week, uh, you know, on last week's episode, we get Isaiah in the beginning of this episode yelling, get out of my house, right? So of course, we're, we're that that is called back to our mind because of course he is, and, and that gets referenced again, because I think that's what Nagel's talking about, obviously, yeah, yeah. when he says, I had this sample, right? So I've, I've, you know, instrumentalized this body in the way that Bucky has been instrumentalized. Yeah. Everybody here is both a victim of of these circumstances and also a perpetrator of them. And and on the Carly thing, it's really what's cool about that is that in a Marvel show, <laughs> they've managed to to really make the terrorist argument a sympathetic one, right? And again, yeah. problematized our like the audience is predisposed to reject might makes right as a philosophy. Yeah. Right. And this episode really kind of opens up all the doors to how actually we think that that's what we think. But in reality, that's not how we think because we root for Steve Rogers when he decides might makes right. And in this particular episode, Carly's kind of argument is a sympathetic one, which is we tried to get justice through discourse, yeah. argumentation, evidence, appeals to people's humanity, and nothing. So we are entitled to use might makes right as a philosophy because that is clearly the only language, as she says, you people understand. Wow. People are probably familiar with the phrase, war is a continuation of politics by other means. So this, this idea is related to what you're talking about, Amanda, because it, it comes from this philosopher Karl von Clausewitz. He writes this treatise on war, German philosopher Clausewitz, obviously. <laughs> What's interesting to me is that the, 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 the phrase that we're familiar with, war is a continuation of politics by other means, is kind of a bad translation of the original because the original actually more probably more clearly says war is a continuation of persuasion by other means. So what happens when diplomacy fails? What happens when us trying to argue with one another about what is the right way forward? What's the just way forward? What will create a more decent society? When that fails, what do we have at our disposal? So for Clausewitz, and he's talking about nation states, not, not individuals necessarily, but what we have is violence, that violence is the next form of force that we can use to get people to do what we think is the only right thing to do or the opposite of the wrong thing that they're doing, whatever it happens to be. And Carly, you know, I think what you're, what, what you're talking about here is that Carly is a, she, she is adopting exactly that stance. Diplomacy didn't work. They didn't give a shit about the fact that we were kicked out of our homes and lost access to resources. And so now because we tried to argue for it and failed, we're going to seize those things. And this is, really important. And there's a lot of Marvel history um, involved in this because Marvel really came to, came of age in the 1960s and was very famously mm. influenced by debates that were coming from the civil rights movement about negotiation versus armed resistance, right? And, and the most famous poem, obviously, that addresses this is Langston Hughes' A Dream Deferred. Uh, and yes, it's not yeah. a poem that's pro-violence, but it is a poem, I think, that is an understanding of violence. And it like it literally says what happens to a dream deferred. Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun, et cetera, et cetera? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load. 
or does it explode? And and his point, obviously, yeah. um, and this I think he wrote this in response to the Watts riots, I want to say. But his point was basically the the point that I think the showrunners are making with Carly, which is like violence doesn't have to be justifiable, but you should at least try to understand why oppressed people resort to it instead of just call them terrorists and and right. and ignore or rioters or you know. And this is so relevant right now because again, we're having the same arguments with the Black Lives Matter movement. Right. Most of those protests were peaceful. A handful, there was some vandalism, some arson, some damage, and it gets hyper-focused on for political gain. But the reason that that is also philosophically unfair is the notion that we can just look at people who take violence into their own hands because they have feel like they have no other options and just say, well, violence is never the answer is super unfair when we have no other answers sometimes for people. Well, and also when, you know, we live in a society where other kinds of violence are done in the name of the might makes right argument by other people, (laughs) right? I mean, what's interesting to me about this problem in this show is that it shows us variations of the problems that come from might makes right. One place where might makes right all the time is in systems that are fundamentally unequal, And this is a world that is fascinated by unequal distributions of power. There is a difference between somebody who has all the power already making the might makes right argument and someone who has no power and feels like they have no power making the might makes right argument. I'm not saying that they're they're either both right or both wrong or one's right or one's wrong, but there are differences between those things, ethical ones that the show is asking us to puzzle through. And it's not giving a clear answer, I think. It's so important. And again, I just cannot emphasize enough, this is why fiction is so much better of a way to address (laughs) these questions a lot of the time than just sort of flattened out debate on social media or whatever. You know, Carly has a sympathetic argument. She still set those guys on fire and we heard them screaming. And there is just ultimately no justification for that. And you can tell that she is turning to the dark side. Yeah. Yeah. We talked about her plans or what we thought were her plans a bit last week. And I think it was reasonable to assume that what we were hearing when she was talking about the world being better the way it was before and all of these other things was that she was opposed to the return of the folks. But in this episode, we definitely learned that, in fact, it's actually the people who stayed who are getting displaced. Because I thought back to Far From Home, which was the first movie that attempted to address some of this. And they talked about Mm. people displaced by the blip. But what I think a lot of us assumed was that based on the ways that things like property law have tended to work, possession does matter a lot. So I think we just assumed that it was the returning people who were displaced. It's interesting to learn that it is definitely the people who were here all along who are frequently being displaced by this society. Yeah, yeah the uh, the literary reference uh, you're looking for there is the prodigal son, right? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean? Oh, yeah. Good. I mean... Um, it is one of the more puzzling uh, fables that Jesus tells in the Bible because it's not entirely sure what his point was, but it was a very good description of human psychology, um, <laughs> in my opinion, which is there's the son that stays on the farm and is dutiful and always stays by his father's side. And then there's the son who gallivants around the world. And when he comes back, he gets the royal treatment that the son who stayed by his father's side didn't get. And there's all sorts of theological analysis that people can make of this. I don't really care about that. I've always thought that story was interesting because I do think it's true that there's a part of human psychology that sort of favors the the thing that you miss more than the thing that you had, right? Mm, and sure. so it makes sense that the people that were were snapped and then came back um, are getting preferential treatment over the people that were already here because they were missed. And that, that increases their value in a way that is not logical. So in case you weren't sure whether this episode was wrestling with the questions of ends justifying means and might making right, Baron Zemo had a little book in his hand and it was the <laughs> quintessential book about this Maeve. I figured you might have a couple thoughts about the fact that Machiavelli actually shows up in the episode itself. Yeah, you know, 
I was pretty thrilled to see that in part because we talked a, a little bit about this in the last episode of the podcast and about the last episode of the show. The idea of ends justifying the means and might makes right. One philosopher that is crucial to understanding this idea and its its centrality to modern civil society is Machiavelli, right? So Machiavelli writes, Niccolo Machiavelli, Italian guy, writes a book called The Prince um, in the 16th century. And it's essentially a job application. He is writing a letter to a prince to say, I'd like a job with you. As what? Like chief supervillain or like how does that? <laughs> like the hand of the king. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, something like that. I don't know. I'm actually not entirely sure. Uh, it's some kind of advisor position, basically. Sure. Sounds like chief supervillain to me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so what's interesting is Niccolo Machia- Machiavelli himself, as a as a human being, was a Republican, right? He believed in the idea of a Republican government, but he was applying for a job with a prince. One of the things that's really fascinating about the prince is that people say that uh, Machiavelli is making a Machiavellian argument, what we now call Machiavellian, which is essentially a defense of the idea that might makes right. He's not really doing that. He's describing the way that state power works. State power works in a very unique way because it has the right to use force because other states are going to use force. Right. Right. And there's this there's this sort of really fascinating and helpful, I think, quotation from the text that I that gets at this. He says, when they and he means people who have power or states, states that have power, when they depend upon their own resources and can employ force, they seldom fail. Hence, it comes that all armed prophets have been virtuous and all unarmed prophets have been destroyed. Wow. Violence works in the modern world. And this is true of the 16th century. It's also, of course, true of our own modern era, that violence has power in the world. And when you choose not to use violence against someone who's using violence, you will fail. It's also one, I mean, to go back to something that Amanda was saying earlier, it's another way of thinking about the dream deferred, right? A community that has experienced only violence it is sometimes unsurprising when something violent comes out of that that may not have been the intention of the movement, but is simply a, a, a byproduct of being subjected to violence. Now, of course, Machiavelli is talking about something else. He's talking about state power. And it's crucial because he's trying to say to the prince, yo, I get it. Yeah. Give me a job because I understand and I will help you understand how to exercise power and how to exercise it, as he says, virtuously. I will say only this else, that when Machiavelli talks about this, he is trying to disaggregate, he's trying to separate the idea of what makes a state virtuous from what makes an individual virtuous. Machiavelli is clear about the fact that this is state power. It's about how states exercise power. And we in the modern world over and over and over again deploy this idea of might makes right I mean, we here don't do that because we're good, Um, (laughs) but other people do as if like being strong makes it okay to be violent. Yeah, it's, I mean. And no individual, that's not, this is not about individuals, it's about states. I mean, obviously he was skirting in some gray areas there, but as a journalist, I can definitely say I recognize the problem of writing something that's descriptive and having people interpret it as prescriptive, but There's English sayings that are very much along the same lines, which are things like, you know, history is written by the winners, things like that. Mm. Those aren't necessarily statements of value. They're just descriptions of how it often goes. Okay, so let me see if I'm tracking, if I can kind of tie this out little bow on what we're talking about for this first primary theme. So the episode is wrestling with the problems of assuming that might makes right, or that you try to justify your means through your ends, right? There are cases in this episode where it's definitely wrong, like exploiting Isaiah Bradley's blood for your own ability to create an army of your personal super soldiers. That's terrible. But there are cases where it's questionable and even wrong, but we can be sympathetic to it like Carly. And then there's cases where we're basically explicitly asked to root for it, like breaking a horrible criminal out of jail so that he can help you track down these other bad guys. And Machiavelli himself even wasn't out there trying to prescribe a particular philosophy. He was describing the way that states exercise power. The description that Machiavelli has for how power works is 
largely embodied by Captain America, but also by the state that did those things to Isaiah Bradley and some of those other things. And there is no easy answer as to whether or not to do this because we all do this at times. It's just that like this episode, the important thing, I guess, is to wrestle with it. Do I have yeah. that right? A plus. Yes. Okay. Hooray. <laughs> I would I would um only there's only one other thing I'd like to say before we move on to the next um topic, which is we talked about the Tuskegee experiments and how much impact they had on earlier episodes of the series. Uh, the discussion of Isaiah Bradley in this episode uh, was clearly inspired by the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks. Hmm. <laughs> and I oh, think that um, yeah. if listeners want to read some more interesting stuff about that, that's a really good book to pick up. It's about the woman whose body uh, generated the cells that they... St- <laughs> and this was like in the like 20s or 30s. Her body generated the cells that they still use to this day to do all sorts of science experiments and her family basically wow. got nothing for it. Uh, wow, that is that is fascinating. I will definitely do some reading on that myself. Amanda, we were watching this and we were loving some of the visuals that jumped out at us. And we talked specifically, you turned to me and said two words and they were Blade Runner. <laughs> I was, it, there was such a Blade Runner vibe to this and... Not to spoil it, but I feel like that might play a role in what you're going to key in on as the second major theme of this episode. So as listeners who've listened to previous episodes know, I love genre, love to talk about genre. So it's kind of both a theme, but it's more importantly a genre. The genre of this episode was film noir. It was very Hmm. clearly a film noir episode. I think that the second episode, like Maeve said, was kind of a Western or an anti-Western The first one was like bedroom drama. But this one, (laughs) this one was film noir. It was the way it was filmed. Everything was in shadow, was contrast between shadows and lights and the way that space was used, the the kind of ways that shots were framed. Uh, The color came from colored film noir. Sometimes that's been ineffective in modern cinema, but when it is effective, like in Blade Runner, it's very effective. And also just kind of the... The way that Madripoor looked was clearly modeled after the modern, the futuristic cities in Blade Runner. But once I like started thinking about Blade Runner and just kind of film noir in general, I, I really realized how much this episode kind of followed a lot of the beats of a film noir kind of narrative. I'll start with Sam because weirdly we haven't actually had a chance to talk with Sam very much about Sam very much because. Sam may not fit too well in the ends justify the means discussion because he absences himself from that. And he does because he plays a role, a classic role in film noir, which is the naive character, right? Hmm. Who's almost always an, a man, is almost always an American, <laughs> and is like this kind of like sweet, good hearted person who thinks as long as you do right, good things will happen and learns in the course of the film about the dirty, dark, decaying world that we live in where categories like good and bad are increasingly meaningless, right? That's kind of the classic noir story. And Sam plays the the role of the, the bright-eyed male ingenue. He doesn't get <laughs> seduced and, and ruined by a, a femme fatale. But other than that, I think he really does kind of play that role. And then we have other people like Sharon Carter is a very classic Nora character, the good girl who's turned bad because the mean streets have turned her into a survivor. Carly, also that character, she was going to be a school teacher, couldn't be sweeter. And now she's an (laughs) actual terrorist. And then we have Bucky, who basically plays the same role as Deckard in Blade Runner, which is to say like this kind of hardened like soldier type who, who wants to be good, but isn't even sure that he's an autonomous person. And then uh, I really love the way they kind of redid Baron Zemo in the episode, which is they kind of restored him to being a Baron so that he could be a faded aristocrat, which is like some stellar noir shit right there. (laughs) Yeah. Returning to your Sam point for a second, obviously Sam has seen some shit, right? The question is not whether Sam is on the whole naive. The question is whether in this episode, and one of the ways I do think what you're saying is reflected is how hard 
everything that happened to Sharon hit him. He was initially even arguing with her when she first showed up about like how this all went down. But by the end on that plane on the way back, he's, you know, really struck by that. And that leads him to that point where he said that memorable line that Maeve pointed out about the fact that, you know, how many people have to be steamrolled for this hunk of metal. And he just is starting to look at this shield as yeah. this problem as much as a solution. So I do think that makes the point. But I just want to make sure, you know, people know it's like the, the point is not whether Sam is a naive person. It's just that yeah. in the context of the lessons being put forth on somebody in this episode, he's playing more of the role of like a Holly Martins than he is somebody who's like the hard boiled badass or whatever yeah and for those who don't know holly martins is this particular character in the third man which is one of mark's Great very movie. favorite movies he's played by joseph cotton in the third man it's a movie about post-war vienna and quite literally his arc in the movie is that he falls in love with this woman who is the classic good girl gone bad survivor on the main <laughs> streets of vienna um, he thinks he can save her, right? He thinks she's clearly a good girl and she just needs the the help of a good man to to be set on the right path. The difference between Holly Martins and the third man and and Sam is that he actually listens to the woman he's trying to right. save That's and a great point <laughs> and learn something, whereas Holly Martins just ends that movie the same dumbass he always was. That's no, that's a great point. <laughs> Sam definitely learns uh, that he created more damage than even he thought. Uh, I also love the fact that Sharon is not that character, the character of the woman who needs to be sort of put back on a on a path, right? She's the one who puts them on the path to save them because otherwise they're going to die. And she's the one who, you know, in, in, in the later part of this episode, she's the one who becomes the philosopher who kind of guides us to under, to think about those problem with symbol those problems with symbols right stars and stripes are bullshit right she's a kind of cynic who guides them towards this the more cynical understanding of the way the world is i will say in some of your better cut of noir like there's kind of two noir films like ways of approaching these female characters there's the the kind of classic she's the femme fatale type yeah. and she's a bad guy and like whatever she's seducing and double crossing or whatever she does is <laughs> is just pure bad right and then there's right, like the third man <laughs> where it's actually cleverly sympathetic to the woman's point of view and is almost kind of subversively feminist in in that male chivalry mm -hmm. is exposed as a lie and more about the man's ego than the woman's what she actually needs in this world. And I think we had that very much happen in this episode with Sam and Sharon. He immediately slides into the chivalrous white knight role, gets slapped down. And because it's, oh, they're only doing noir for this episode, I suspect. <laughs> and also they don't <laughs> want to make him a jackass. <laughs> Right. Yeah. He, no, he actually learns that's not how this is going to be. But they, they definitely play with that dynamic that's very much embedded in the noir um, genre. So Maeve, talk to me about some noir movies or books or anything that, that this reminded you of. There's so much good stuff that, that seems resonant here. So one, one is The Outsider. Um, 1979 film directed by Tony Laroski. It's a film that I think resonates really with Bucky's storyline more than anybody else in this episode. Um, so it's a story about a guy who he's an American guy. He um, decides that he wants to jump in with the IRA conflict in Ireland and then realizes that he's being used, right? That he is being kind of instrumentalized by this effort. So his 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 commitment to the kind of politics of of the the, the liberation movement in Ireland tur it turns out that it is kind of enslaves him. Um and then he has to kind of wrestle with the problem of the relationship between the individual and political structures and systems that fundamentally kind of uh, devour humanity. Um, and I think so. I, so that film felt to me like a kind of clear resonance for Bucky, and also for 
for a show that is attempting to think about what happens when the individual tries to intercede in political conflict, right? What kind of difference can I make? How can I make that difference? And here in this episode, Bucky has to like return to a space where his humanity doesn't matter in order to get the job done. And I do think, I do hope and think that the show will wrestle with that a little bit more, that that even if we abandon the noir genre, we're going to get more of Bucky sort of dealing with the fact that he had to return to being the Winter Soldier. Amanda, what about you? Any movies jumping to mind that are especially Falcon and the Winter Soldiery? Well, on the sort of topic of what Maeve was kind of saying about how noir like really kind of is often about systems versus individuals. Um, we recently watched a really good 1957 film uh, called Nacht wenn der Teufel kam. I think I pronounced that correctly. Nacht wenn der Teufel kam. And that, that means the devil strikes at night. Mm. Uh, I highly recommend this movie. It, it was It's one of the best noir movies I've ever seen. It's a German film. It was filmed in Berlin. It's It was filmed in the 50s, but it's about Nazi Germany. And it really does very, very well what noir films do, which is be kind of, you know, like last episode, uh, we talked about the kind of Western genre. I would say that noir is the anti-Western, right? Mm -hmm. The Western is very much about the lone cowboy and, and the, the romanticization of the individual and this kind of individualistic narrative. Whereas the whole point of literally almost any noir film is that people are victims or subjects of systems that are beyond their control. And so these kinds of the kind of black and white moralizing of a Western doesn't make sense because a lot of the time people are doing what they need to, to survive. And this movie is very good because it really draws that out with the detective who's trying to solve murders in Nazi Germany. <laughs> and, and you find out like, Americans might be like, that's dumb, but you know, Nazi Germany also like had to do normal stuff, like have cops that solve murders. Right. <laughs> um, they weren't, you know, people live their lives within it. And so this movie kind of examines what it must be like to be a cop trying to solve a serial killing, killing situation in a context where the government is just over the top up in people's shit, right? Right. And everything yeah. is political and nothing is 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 pristine and apolitical. And no matter how good and noble our hero is, and he is pretty good noble guy, he still works for the Nazi government. <laughs> yeah. And he still is as noble as his aims are in terms of trying to stop a serial killer, he's still still contam morally contaminated by working for the Nazi government. So it's a very good movie. I highly recommend, but it, it, it reminds me of Falcon and the Winter Soldier, both for the World War II kind of connection, but also in the way that this episode in particular was really questioning the Steve Rogers mentality, which is like, I'm just a good person and I can just change the world single-handedly because... Right. Everybody in this is so caught in the system that what is right and what is wrong is not super clear. You've got me thinking about the fact that, and I haven't thought about this, the Western in this way before, but they're in the Western, like in a lot of these sort of conservative, heroic tales, there is a coherence between the personal and the public, the personal and the global. There's a coherence between the personal will and the personal needs and what's going on out there. And these two things can meet in this kind of perfect harmony and we can progress together by way of this individual's will. The thing that's fascinating about noir, and this is going to sound real different from what you're talking about, but I think it's related to what you're saying. The thing that happens in the noir is that there is no immediate coherence between the personal experience and the, the public conditions, the systemic problems of the world. And the person who comes to mind for me about this, uh, modern noir, arguably, um, is Wong Kar Wai, filmmaker who makes Happy Together. He makes Chunking Express, which is a noir film from 1994, 
which has got some detectives who are looking for love. <laughs> and the thing I love about Wong Kar Wai is that whatever the film, whatever story he's telling, whether it's a truly tragic tale of queer characters searching for love in a world that denies them that, or something that is, isn't as dark as that, right? Like something like Chungking Express, the question at the heart of it is what does the individual do to carve out a space of of personal development and personal fulfillment and per personal desire and personal satisfaction in a world that wasn't made for them, wasn't made for their personal flourishing. Yeah. Right. It's, it's, it, there's something very, uh, there's something deeply, but really subtly opposite about the idea that the cowboy's narrative is the narrative of America or whatever, right? Like, the individual's narrative is the narrative of the collective. The noir story is a story ab about that, about those two things coming into conflict with one another and the, the non-resolution, right? No noir story has a happy ending. <laughs> no. Right? Yeah, That's at best, it's a mixed result. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's true. The cowboy movie plays up isolation as this virtuous quality, whereas most yeah. of the detectives in your noir stories are also very isolated and lonely figures. But that's not a good thing, and it usually doesn't work out that way. In this episode, Sharon is definitely our hard-boiled person. She's the one who's isolated. She can't reach her family. She doesn't have any true friends. She's just out there trying to reside, right? If, if Sam is our naive, Sharon is our hard-boiled detective, right? Do, do I have that right? <laughs> and Bucky. And Bucky, yeah. And Bucky. Yeah, I mean, point. Sharon also gets at one of those common noir themes around futility, that she's so skeptical that anything means a damn or that Sam can come through <laughs> for her, that any of this is going to work out or have a happy ending. Like you were saying, the hero stuff is all bullshit, right? For her perspective, she, the, the scales have fallen completely from her eyes. You know, obviously, I mentioned it in passing earlier, but I think it's worth kind of circling around to Blade Runner again, because... Hmm. One of the reasons, it's a science fiction film, but one of the reasons it's a classic noir film is it really gets at those themes that Maeve was talking about, that Mark was talking about, isolation, the instrumentalization of human beings, right? In Blade Runner, it's turned into this sci-fi kind of literalism, which is what sci-fi is very good at, right? These, yeah. these replicants are literally people that are made to be used and discarded. And they reject that. Um, the entire movie is driven by the fact that they reject that. And the entire movie is also kind of focused on the question of whether or not we're all that because the line between who's a replicant and who's a human just gets torn apart as the movie goes on to the point where director's cut or no by the end it's very clear that Deckard is probably also a replicant and he doesn't even know it right yeah. and he thought he was a person and the question is what does that even mean and and obviously like all noir films the answer is humanity is being squished underneath these kinds of oppressive systems and and it asks you to be it I wouldn't call noir films nihilistic, at least the good ones. I would call them um, very human, humanistic, because yeah. the whole point of them is you should have sympathy for people that are often demonized in our society because if you walked a mile in their shoes, you would see that they often made choices that they had to to survive. Yeah, that the I, I, I teach I teach Blade Runner as almost as often as I teach Mad Max Fury Road because it is also an extraordinarily beautiful film, problematic more so than something like Mad Max Fury Road in a variety of ways. Um, but it's beautiful because it asks us to empathize deeply, right? That that final scene with Deckard and Roy where, you know, Roy has, you know, has the dove and he he says – to Decker, quite an experience to live in fear, isn't it? That's what it is to be a slave. The, the thing to me about noir is that it operates in the in interrogative mode. And what I mean by that is that it asks a series of questions. It doesn't answer them, but it asks us to live inside the mind of the person asking them. Quite an experience to live in fear, isn't it? <laughs> 
Carly is that character for us in addition to others here. But Carly is one of those figures here to live in the question of what could it be like if I, if I could have lived a different life, if I could have been a teacher of history or art. It's such a funny little collection of things that she's thinking about there. They're utterly different. Like one is a reflective field, right? Mm -hmm. Like that looks at the past. Art, I mean, she doesn't say art history. She says art, right? So that's that's a that's a productive field about about practices about skills she doesn't she doesn't need to really make sense there we just need to feel what she feels in that moment which is talent wasted or potential unused or like goodness denied right like it's like yeah. it's a chance at like her betterness her best self was yes. taken from her and we feel that we can't, yeah. and, and that is noir, I mean, this goes back to what I was saying about like the, the, the way that the camera angles place us in the position of, of understanding collateral damage kind of imminently, like in the moment, right? There's something about the way that this episode is also asking us a la noir in the, in the form of noir to live in the questions, those existential questions that we then empathize with. What is it to be a slave? What is it to not have your potential fulfilled? I mean, the symbolism of the art that Sharon has stolen is oh, works on so wow. many levels. So good, yeah. Because I mean, yeah, these are the most precious things that humans have ever created. And they have been basically turned into toys for rich people yeah. and deprived the world has been stolen from the world and put away. And yet also it's not as simple as that because the world doesn't necessarily appreciate them. It just works on so many levels and it's not a black and white thing. It's it's it, the wrongness of it works on many levels, but also you can kind of, you don't hate Sharon for stealing this art because it's not about her. Yeah. Well, but also it's sitting in the Louvre. Is it really a whole lot better there? Like, <laughs> well, I mean, there, there's actually, a, I mean, it is people can a see it there. there, right? There's a serious argument yeah. about what constitutes, there's a whole like bunch of philosophy around this question of the Commonwealth, right? Like, yeah, I mean, I think we all agree that the art should be in a museum where people, it belongs to all people, yeah. but it's a interesting symbol of kind of alienation to take art that should belong to everybody and, and have it in this kind of ridiculously decadent context yeah. uh, where only people that have too much fucking money... Yeah. <laughs> Enough money that they can just splash a Manhattan on a Monet. Oh. <laughs> yeah, if I can tie our two topics together, I feel like Mike could make right in this case. If you can beat three people to death with a small pipe, you get to have a Monet. <laughs> Does that... Is that what you guys are trying to tell me or no? no I'm getting that wrong, probably. I, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I don't know about that. Yeah, that's probably uh, but not... I, but it's certainly the certainly the world they live in is if you can amass enough money through illegal and, and immoral means you can own a Monet. Well, and this is a story about inequality, right? Like if you know, if if we tie this together with the stuff that we talked about last episode, right? And 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 thinking about the problems of the the unequal distribution of resources, the problem isn't that individuals are stupid or bad. It's that there's a, a universe out here that we are living inside of that dictates that these are the ethical parameters by which we have to operate. And Sharon is a symptom of that. She, you know, lives in a world of unequal distribution. And this is how it goes. And she's stuck too. Yeah, it's true. And so is Carly and the Flag Smashers. Yeah. And the one thing I will like... I think to like in this kind of discussion about film noir on is an important part from the third man, which is Orson Welles's character in the movie is kind of treated throughout the movie as like this fun Robin hood figure, right? He he's everyone likes him. They view him as that kind of person, a someone who steals from the man and stuff. And then when you find out is actually the resources he was stealing um, needed to go to children who 
end up basically <laughs> mentally yeah. handicapped or dead because they didn't get the medicine that they needed because he stole it. It's actually another connection to last episode because it's vaccines in both cases. Yeah, and I think that's very deliberate. We see the the Flag Smasher stealing resources and saying they're not being used. And maybe that's true. But I th- one thing that a, a, nor- a good Nor movie like The Third Man would do is immediately complicate that narrative for you. Yeah. Yeah. So if I'm following... Our second major takeaway is less about a specific theme and more the idea that this episode functioned as a mini noir film, both in the way it was shot, the light and the shadows and everything you talked about in terms of the, 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 the framing, but also in terms of the characters themselves playing some traditional noir roles like Sharon Carter with the sort of mean streets, badass, Sam is our naive, Bucky, you know, trying to escape demons that he can't quite run from. And at the same time, It's also very much a continuation of last episode's anti-Western philosophy and builds on that by creating these complicated questions because like noir, there's no easy answers to most of the obstacles or questions this episode puts in front of our characters. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that feels like a great place to leave this episode. I'm very excited for our next one already. Amanda, thank you so much for joining us on StoryCast. Thank you, and see you in a couple minutes. Yeah. Um, I'm going to come take take apart that mic. <laughs> Maeve, thank you so much uh, for joining us on StoryCast. Thank you. This was fun. All right. Audio Avengers, that is our show for today. We have so much more to talk about on CharacterCast and PonderVision, so stay tuned for those. And if you can, leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or tell a friend about our show. Anything you can do to help us spread the word would mean the world to us. Let's go break someone out of prison, guys. (laughs) 